Hello and welcome to Global Armenians. With us in studio is Ronald Altoon, world-renowned architect with offices around the world. And he's here because he made a presentation at uh, the American University of Armenia yesterday. He's going to talk about his presentation, his lecture, and a little bit about your career. Welcome to Armenia. Thank you. Very, always a pleasure to be here. I want to go back um, to December 7th uh, when the Spitak earthquake took place. And prior to that, um, what was your connection with your Armenian ethnicity and then what happened on that day? Uh, I was a third generation Armenian. My grandparents had immigrated here uh, before the genocide, but at the time of the uh, gathering storm. And um, my parents were both born in Fresno, uh, did not meet there, met in Los Angeles. Uh, and I grew up as a typical American kid. Uh, I had few Armenian friends because there were few Armenians in Los Angeles in those days. Uh, my grandfather in the early part of uh, the 20th century uh, was one of a small group of maybe no more than 50 families and he and uh, part of that group built the first Armenian church in Los Angeles. So we go way, way back and I was always familiar with my family Armenian roots. I just didn't have Armenian friends because there weren't many where I lived. Uh, so for me, uh, my Armenian awakening occurred on December 7th. Uh, it was uh, a morning, uh, television was on. Uh, they announced the earthquake in Spitak and 5,000 people were feared dead and there were no pictures. And I sat on the edge of my bed waiting for pictures. I'm a very visual person and I sat there for four hours and I finally decided I needed to get up and go to work. By the time I came home that evening, there were some pictures, and they were horrific. And day by day, it got worse, and the body count kept rising and rising and rising. And I, I felt, you, I just have to do something. And by then, there were young people in front of all the supermarkets collecting change from people to send money to Armenia. And I knew you couldn't send enough money. You had to you had to bring some intellectual capital that could be applied across the country over time that would make a difference. And so uh, I contacted, uh, through my, my, my sister, um, I contacted someone at the Armenian Assembly who made some phone calls and I made some calls to the American Institute of Architects and organized uh, an intervention of uh, seven of us that would come to Armenia uh, in March of the following year, after, after you go through the first stage of, of saving people who you can and removing debris, then you start planning. It was during the planning stage. And knowing that there would be no equipment here, no art supply store around the corner, uh, I was able to get about four crates of, of a, blue, a blueprint machine, ammonia, paper, uh, parallel bars, drawing boards, all the things that you drew with before computers, uh, before cell phones. And I had four crates of those and textbooks and things and we came to Armenia. And we were positioned up at the Design Institute, up, up above, Obavian, up on the hill, Obavian, up on the hill. And uh, we worked there uh, day and night, uh, master planning the rebirth of Spitak. We had visited Spitak and Gumri, which was Leninikan at the time. We had seen the devastation. Uh, it was traumatic, even then. And you saw the expression on people's faces and it was a mixture of absolute torment and absolute joy and hospitality. I mean, people could not have been more welcoming and more disengaged in a sense. And we worked and we produced uh, these, these drawings and they presented them to the Union of Armenian Architects. And the most senior architect was in the local Politburo. And he came and he looked at the drawings and he said, what's that? I said, that's a chapel. He says, we don't build churches in Armenia. We haven't built churches since the revolution. And I looked at him and I said, you'll build this one. Those people who died, are your responsibility. They deserve a memorial. And he looked at me and he said, you have the orientation wrong. The altar should be on the east. And I said to myself, I've got him. I said, 
it is to the east. And we built that chapel. And it stands there today, and they've rebuilt most of Spitak now. So that was my orientation to not only Armenia, but uh, to my roots. Did all of the plans that you designed and you thought about and you created, were they all implemented? Uh, probably not, but I think the, the general framework was implemented. Uh, I have been back and I've driven through the town and uh, the, the, the format is there. Um, we, we designed a prototype residential building, a prototype public gathering space and market in some public buildings uh, and the chapel. Um, but there was much more to design, so it really it gave it a vision, and others here have, have implemented that vision. Even though we've heard explanations as to why all those buildings fell, um, you said something interesting before our interview. You're explaining why those buildings failed here versus elsewhere. Uh, all of all of the Soviet Union had a, a, a system of delivering buildings, and that system was organized by groups that were called Gostroy. And Gostroy was the design and construction organization that handled planning, manufacturing, transport, and construction. So they had total responsibility for buildings. But the initial planning and design of buildings occurred in Moscow. And Moscow sits on a plain. And there are no earthquakes in Moscow, there's just wind. And, and in Moscow, you hold buildings up. In earthquake country, you hold them down. So they're engineered upside down. And so when the earthquakes hit and a force hits the bottom of the building, the building wants to twist over. And you have to prevent that from happening. What happened in Armenia when that lateral force hit, the building simply collapsed. I mean, it was, it was frightening. And hopefully we've come to understand that very you know, dynamic uh, because of folks like you have come here. Between uh, Spitag earthquake and your involvement here at AUA, what other projects were you involved in? Did you visit? I got involved with the Armenian Assembly of America. They asked me on a pro bono basis if, if uh, we would um, organize the planning and design of three factories to produce door and window frames, concrete blocks, and roofing material, which we did. And so my third trip to Armenia was at the groundbreaking for those factories where I brought my wife and we came and uh, reconnected with the architects that we had met here locally uh, who had come from Yerevan to the groundbreaking for that ceremony. Okay, and then we'll jump forward to the building at AUA, the Avedisian building. Uh, how did you approach something at an American university in Yerevan in an older neighborhood? Oh, well, the first thing is that it's an American university, and it's the only university affiliated with the University of California system. So first and foremost, it had to meet all of the requirements of the University of California, which means all the code requirements, and it had to meet all the code requirements of Yerevan. And in some cases, those might be in conflict with one another. So the first thing you had to do is deal with two masters. The site uh, <laughs> next to the Bagramian building, the Bagramian building was the Communist Party headquarters building. It's rather ironic now that the repository of uh, market-driven thinking is the old Communist Party headquarters. Um, but we were taken to the site and shown the site, and it, truthfully, when you see it for the first time, uh, it, it, was, it was rather depressing. Uh, it was in shambles, it was ugly, the park was not cared for, the residential area around was uh, deprived, uh, the building itself was depleted. Um, and you look at that and you say, on a scale of one to 10, this is about a minus 10. So coming from minus 10, no matter what you do, there'll be an improvement. And if you can get it up to a plus eight, plus nine, you have about an 18 point psychological change, this will be an enormous transformation. So it's really an ideal site, except it's a highly sloped site. So you had to deal with a grade that was very intense. There were two pathways that crossed through the site that the city required to be maintained. The shape of the site was very odd and it kind of tucked behind the Bagramian building just a bit. So it, it began as a not very happy opportunity and between the site and the building was a loading dock for the Bagramian building. So you begin to say, so how do we deal with all of this? 
And when we climbed up on the site and turned around, we saw Mount Ararat. And we said, this is an extraordinary site. What a great opportunity. Now, how do we deal with the deficits and turn them around? The program of the building was too large to fit on the site um, without running in an east-west direction, uh, which would be ideally suited for uh, an environmental design. Maximum heat gain in the winter, minimum impact of the setting sun in the summer and so forth. But with the path coming through, there was a problem. So immediately, um, the first thing we did actually was to research historic Armenian architecture. And we went around to uh, 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 Korverab and, and uh, Gegart and Garni and uh, Hagbat and Sanain and Noravank. And Noravank was really wonderful because at Noravank, there are two chapels that are twisted just a bit from each other. And that became the inspiration for breaking the program in two pieces and taking those that were internally organized, the auditorium, the tiered classrooms, the laboratories, the toilets, and so forth, and putting them in a, in a box that sat essentially behind the Bagramian building, and then snapping it like a green stick fracture and putting the other piece focused to Mount Ararat, where the offices and the gathering spaces all faced that. Anytime you walked in and out of that building, anytime you used a stairway, you looked at Mount Ararat when you can see it. And then the knuckle that joined them together was where the elevator would be and the lobby, and then we added a bridge to connect to Bagramian, and we raised the building up and let the pathway come underneath. So the city got its pathway, the people that lived in the community didn't have to walk around the building. And then our client, uh, who is really the donor, uh, Ed Avedisian, said, I want several things. Number one, I want an education that's transparent. So the whole idea of a building where this knuckle was all glass and transparent, and you always saw in and out of the building, that was number one. He said, number two, I want to bring new technologies to Armenia. So we introduced for the first time a post-tension concrete, which is much more defensible against seismic action. Uh, we imported the technology, we imported a crew to train people, and after they poured the first floor, the locals did the rest. We, we imported the idea of a sustainable building. Uh, so if, if the funds had been available to have gone through the process of uh, LEED certification, this building would have been LEED certified. We introduced things like a breathing skin, where the pieces of tufa don't touch each other. Now you see some, tufa is a very brittle material. And in Armenia, when you get an earthquake, they crack the tufa. So we held each piece apart, hung it on a rack, had a space, and then the waterproofing and insulation, and then the interior wall of the building. So when heat would build up on the building, it would escape through the ventilation. When cold would hit it, it wouldn't be transmitted into the building. So there was a breathing skin. Then we had double glazing and triple glazing for the first time in Armenia. We had light shelves and, and, and louvers to block the sun to get better solar protection. We created an area on the roof for a solar farm. And we embodied something that was actually developed here at AUA, which is, it's a kind of a heat wheel where cold air is brought in, is warmed for the building, and then you would typically exhaust it and have to reheat all the air. Well, their idea was, let's take it and run it through a, a coil that rotates, that captures that heat and spins around. So when the cold air comes in, it goes through that heat. So you're actually reusing energy. It was a wonderful idea. It was originated there, and we incorporated that into the building as well. Magnificent. You mentioned a little bit of influence from our ancient architectural techniques and all these new innovations. Those, um, have they influenced your vision when you do work in places like Shanghai or you know, your presence in Hong Kong, Moscow, Amsterdam? Yeah. Do you take any of that with you? What I take with me is a profound respect for context. Uh, many architects define context as the physical setting, what, what buildings are across the street or next door. For me, it's a much more holistic description. Context for me begins with the natural environment, 
the action of sun, wind, precipitation, temperature, humidity. It's the, it's the geographic setting of geology, landscape, and water. Uh, it's the historic setting that ties to traditions and craft and, and materiality. Uh, it's the natural setting that deals with natural resources that are available to use from the local area. Uh, it's the uh, urban setting that talks about the urban framework, the, the uh, uh, mobility of people through transportation systems, infrastructure, and so forth, walkability. It ties to the, the human forces of politics, economics, social structure, culture, and religion. And then there are the, all the other forces that are market forces like, like demographics and psychographics and all those things. We look at all those things very broadly. And while we had always been doing some of that, when I came here for AUA and we researched for that building, it became so important to make that building a 21st century building to be proud of our time, but also proud of our heritage. And so, apart from just the shape of the building, were the materials on the building of tufa stone and basalt. It was the layering of the building. If you look at historic Armenian churches, there are layers from the pure geometry, working out to a level of decoration, to how windows are formed in multiple layers. You see it here at the Hotel Armenia. You see it in the wonderful buildings. They're all done with these, these layers. And, and flatness and, and, and rugged stonework. All these are voices that I'm hearing from the past that come. It's almost you have to be all-knowing to be able to create structures uh, and do them right, which probably is a huge dialogue that we can have about what Yerevan is facing in terms of its ar architectural identity. We've run out of time, but I want to talk to you about what you presented to the students yesterday. You had a message for them at AUA in a campus that you helped shape and create. What was your message to them? My message is that these students are being trained in English, which is the language of international business. They're being trained in professions that are applicable anywhere in the world, and more specifically within the re greater region that you live in, where you're surrounded by enemies. To the extent that you can apply the knowledge that you learn here, not only here, but more globally, and bring back to Armenia best practices from around the world, you will inform a better Armenia. By doing that, you'll build bridges and relationships outside Armenia. And Armenia has enemies that would maybe be less enemies if Armenia were more essential to them, alive and well, than wounded and hurt. You provide health care to neighbors that need it badly. You provide engineering to neighbors that need it badly, business techniques and other things. They want to be your partner instead of your enemy. So I tried to leave them with a message of an optimistic future for Armenia. And you used your example and your successes, starting with your modest practice and becoming a global presence. I had a very modest beginning and a modest practice, and I simply decided that the only thing preventing me from doing what the big guys were doing was me. And if I got rid of that barrier and just said, just do it, we could thrive. We've worked in 43 countries. Uh, we've, we've built probably 200 million feet of building. And, um, and there's nothing special about us except um, being entrepreneurial and a desire to just do it. And Altoon Partners is on the web so people can see all that you've done. One more message you had for young ladies uh, at the lecture. I did. I have a fondness for, for um, helping young ladies in careers. And, um, and my wife has done the same thing. And, and, I, and I told them that um, they possess ways of thinking about the world that are completely different than the way men think about it. It's the old thing about men being hunters and women being gatherers. They build relationships. They do research. They understand the holistic integration of all the pieces uh, very, very well. Their voices need to be heard. And I encourage them to not, not accept the traditions that, that you have a role to play and it's not this role. Pick the role that's right for you. Enjoy your life. Be strong.
my wife had a choice to make. She wanted to go back to school, to law school. All the Armenians around us said no. She went to law school. She thrived. She became a judge. She's advising. She's actually advising the children of those people who said not to go to law school. My, my sons have married professional women. In my family, we have a dentist and we have a financial advisor. We have a university president. And so there are no limits other than the ones you impose on yourself. Just do it and Godspeed. And if we think that way as a nation, as a people, we think 25th century, then there's no stopping us. We, we're one of the most literate nations in the world. We're hardworking, we're creative, we're entrepreneurial. We can do this. And we're proud to have folks like you being part of this nation and our people. Well, thank you. Mr. Alton, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And we hope to see you back in Armenia again. Yeah, it's always a pleasure to be here. All right, thank you at home for joining us on CivilNet.